namo bhagavate vasudevaya Rapanosmi Mahayogin Rapanosmi Mahayogin Mahapurusha Satpate Satpate Anujani Himam Deva Anujani Himam Deva Sarva Lokeshwareshwara Rapan Prapanosmi Mahayogi Prapanosmi Mahayogi Mahapurusha Satpate Anujani Himam Deva Sarva Lokeshwareshwara Prapanosmi Mahayogi Mahapurusha Satpate Anujani Himam Deva Sarva Lokeshwareshwara Surrendered. Surrendered. Asmi. Asmi. I am. am. Mahayogin. O greatest of all possessors of mystic power. power. Mahapurusha. O greatest of all personalities. personalities. Satpate. O master of the devotees. Anujanihi, Anujanihi. Please, order. please order. Mom, Mom. Me. me, Deva, Deva. Oh, God. oh God, Sarva, Sarva. of all, of all. Loka. Loka, of the worlds, of the Ishwara. Ishwara. Ishwara, of the controllers, of the controllers. Ishwara. Ishwara. Ishwara, O Supreme Controller. O Supreme O master of mystic power, O great personality, O Lord of the devotees, I surrender to you. Please command me as you will, O supreme God, Lord of all lords 
of the universe. O oh, infallible one, I was immediately freed from the Brahmin's punishment simply by seeing you. Anyone who chants your name purifies all who hear his chanting as well as himself. How much more beneficial then is the touch of your lotus feet? Thus receiving the permission of Lord Krishna, the demigod Sudarshan circumambulated him, bowed down to offer him homage, and then returned to his heavenly planet. Nanda Maharaj was thus delivered from peril. The inhabitants of Braj were astonished to see the mighty power of Sri Krishna. Dear King, they then completed their worship of Lord Shiva and returned to Braj. Along the way, respectfully describing Krishna's powerful acts. Once Lord Govinda and Lord Ram, the performers of wonderful feats, were playing in the forest at night with the young girls of Braj. Purport. This verse introduces a new pastime. According to the Acharyas, the occasion mentioned here is the Holika Purnima, a day also known as Gaur Purnima. Om Ajnan Timidandasya Kyananjana Chalakaya Chakshuru Nilitam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Pandeham Sri Guru Sri Juta Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajataham Sahagana Raghunathan Pitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Padijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padahan Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Bitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dinabandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kansana Godangi Radhe Vrindabhaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Bancha Kalpata Rubyascha Kripasindubya Epacha Patitanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, chapter, four, chapter 34, entitled Nanda Maharaj Saved and Shankar Chuda Slain, text 16 through 20. In this narration, Sri Sukadev Goswami tells 
a beautiful but simultaneously ghastly incident that took place just after the Ras Lila of Lord Krishna. In the previous five chapters to this, we have been reading about Krishna calling the gopis of Vrindavan with his flute. And that song captivated, enchanted their hearts in such a way that they literally left behind everything else in their life risked their health, risked all their possessions, risked their relationships to serve Krishna. Last night we were speaking and someone was asking about the difference between fear of God or fear and love because this is a apparent um, inconsistency within religion. As we are taught to fear, fear God. And then we're also taught to love God. And love is not usually something that's born of fear. We find here the gopis were completely fearless. They were fearless of everything. They had no fear of death. They had no fear of losing their loved ones. They had no fear of being totally dishonored and banished by the entire society. And what caused them to surrender to Krishna in this way? Such a surrender as the world has never known. It was the sweetness of Krishna's song, his flute. Krishna's love awakened their love in such a way that Abhaya Charanadavindare, they became absolutely fearless. In bhakti, this is the state of consciousness that we're all aspiring for. Where we come beyond not only fear of God, but fear of all the things in this material world out of natural love. Our only fear in love is to displease the Lord. We're not afraid of the punishment of the Lord because whatever, as long as we please him, we don't really mind what we do. Of course, as long as we are, we don't have that love, then we should fear to some extent. So Krishna and the gopis, they perform their beautiful dance of love for an entire night of Brahma. And Krishna arranged that, what is it, four billion, three hundred twenty million years, he put it within one, within twelve hours. That is his speciality, as being the controller of all controllers. Krishna says, time I am in Bhagavad Gita. What does that actually mean? Not only is he creating and destroying everything that exists within creation as time, but also he could make time go any way he wants. No matter how wealthy, no matter how politically powerful, no matter how academically intelligent anyone is within this world, we cannot, we cannot adjust or change the way time is moving. 
we have our choice what to do within the movement of time. But we cannot change time. But Krishna, this is one of his opulences. He's Swarat, he's independent, he can do as he likes. If he wants, he could make time go backward. He could make it go sideways. He could make a moment 12 years or more. He could make 4,320,000,000 years. The full experience of that entire span of time, he can put it within 12 hours. That is a chintya shakti, inconceivable power. So after we read about this beautiful, loving pastime of Krishna with gopis, most celebrated of all his pastimes, the next narration of Shukadeva Goswami is how Nanda Maharaj and the Brijbasis, they go to celebrate Shivaratri. They go up the Jamuna to a place Shiva Goswami tells it was Shivaratri and it was someplace northwest of Mathura. And honoring this great expansion of the Lord, Vaishnavanam Yatashambhu, Lord Shiva, they worshipped him, they offered him flowers. They offered prayers. They bathed in the rivers. Actually, it was the river Saraswati. And they fasted only by drinking water. And as after they did their pujas, they took rest in this beautiful forest on the banks of the Saraswati River. In the nature of the world is we just do not know what may happen next. Because sometimes we think we worship the Lord and it's such a nice place and we're with the people we love the most and we're doing tapasya. So Krishna, Shiva, Vishnu, they must be pleased. So I must be safe. But that's not always the way it is. They performed all the religious activities very carefully. And as they were sleeping, suddenly the cowherd men woke up hearing Nanda Maharaj crying out helplessly, Krishna, save me, Krishna, save me. When they opened their eyes, they were horrified what they saw. A gigantic serpent was swallowing Nanda Maharaj. His body was already deep in the body and the mouth of this massive snake. So the cowherd men wanted to do something to help. They got flaming, burning torches. So many of them, as hard as they could, they were beating the snake, beating, beating, beating. And although this massive snake was being beaten by burning logs and torches, he kept, kept swallowing Nanda Maharaj, who was going deeper and deeper and deeper into the belly of this snake. Nanda Maharaj was helpless. Just think of that. Put yourself in Nanda Maharaj's position being swallowed by a snake. Some of us may be afraid of snakes. Even, other, even small snakes. <laughs> even little tiny snakes we're afraid of because it may be poisonous. And sometimes snakes are very fast. If they want to bite you, they just... <laughs> yes? quite empowered. 
And we hear so many stories of people who were killed by snake bites. Narada Muni, in his previous life, his mother was killed by a snake bite when she just went to milk a, she just went to milk a cow like any other day. And suddenly, <laughs> that's why in many villages in India today, what to speak of the past, people actually have temples of snakes. You have seen, especially in South India, because it's a, because it happens. People at the least expect moment become bit and killed. So let, let us try to pacify the, the snake. The snakes by some puja. There's some temples I have seen where they actually give milk and cobras come and drink the milk every day. Right in the temple. And that's part of the puja. If, they, if we give them nice milk, they won't bite us. I think that's the psychology. <laughs> <laughs> The little snakes give us some fear. Can you imagine the size of the snake? Nanda Maharaj was being swallowed alive. And all the gopas who were there, seeing their king, he was more than their father to them. Sunandan was there the younger brother of Nanda Maharaj, they were all seeing this happening. It was terrible. They loved him so dearly. What to speak of being swallowed by a snake? Can you imagine if your father, who you love so dearly, who's done everything for you, if he's being swallowed by a a monstrous snake? They were beating and beating, but their beating was... Nothing. It had no effect. The snake was really enjoying eating Nanda Maharaj. (laughs) It was a higher taste than all of (laughs) it. He didn't mind getting beaten by the flaming torches. And Nanda Maharaj, who was maintaining Krishna as his own son, He never was thinking Krishna's the supreme God. He was thinking Krishna's my son. He was always worried about him, always protecting him, feeding him, along with Mother Yashoda. They would give him prasad, they would bathe him, they would dress him, they would pray for him. But when it came to a time when he was totally desperate and totally helpless and nobody else could help him. Such a great soul is Nanda Maharaj. He couldn't help himself. He was obviously struggling to get out of that snake mouth, but he was going deeper and deeper and deeper. Snakes have incredible powers. Once they get you, that you just go deeper and deeper and deeper, like in quicksand, into the body of the snake. So he was helpless. And all the cowherd men, they could do nothing to help him. By his own endeavors, by the endeavors of all of his friends and relatives, he was helpless. Sometimes death is compared to a snake. Being swallowed by the snake of death, like this snake. And when that snake of death comes, what can you do? You can't help yourself. And nobody else can help you either when you start getting swallowed. Neither the government's military You can't bribe somebody to get you out of the 
jaws of your death. There's nothing. Your friends, your relatives, your loved ones. Death is like a snake in that sense. But if we cry out for Krishna, he can save us from the jaws of death. And ultimately, in that emergency situation, Nanda Maharaj, he wasn't even considering Krishna the Supreme Lord. That wasn't his mentality. He just, his natural love for Krishna, even if Krishna is not God, even if it's just my little son, in this emergency situation, it was just the spontaneous cry of his heart that Krishna could save me. Krishna walked right up to that snake and very gracefully placed his lotus foot on the body of the snake. As soon as he did that, something extraordinary happened. The snake was no longer a snake. Within a flash of an instant, the snake manifested the form of a beautiful demigod, a Vidyatara. He had a shining, human-like demigod form. He was wearing ornaments of jewels and gold. He bowed down to Krishna and with folded hands began to offer prayers. Now he was speaking, but Krishna wanted everyone to hear what he was going to say. So Krishna knows everything. But to make his pastimes very exciting and to bring our attention deeper into the pastimes, Krishna asks the obvious question, Who are you? (laughs) Because (laughs) quite dramatic performance. Massive snake swallowing my father. And now, in a moment, the snake is gone and he's a beautiful demigod. And he asked, why did he ask? Because what this personality was about to say is so important for everyone to hear. In fact, Krishna asked that personality, who are you? And why did you become a snake? Why, are, why were you a snake? And why are you now like this? <clears throat> Krishna asked that question so that you and me could hear the answer today. In 2014. <laughs> January 4th. Let's say at 7 K.M. Munchi Marg and Chopa. <laughs> Chopati Mumbai four zero 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 seven. That is Krishna. He knows past, present, and future. He wanted us to hear the answer because it's so crucial to our spiritual progress. He introduced himself as Sudarshan, <clears throat> who is the most famous, most. Um, powerful of a particular community of demigods, devas, called the Vidyadharas. In so many prayers in the Puranas and in the Vedas, we find um, the Vidyadharas coming forward and speaking descriptions of Vidyadharas. Sudarshan was the most prominent of them. He has a very handsome, beautiful body, very eloquent way of speaking, incredible intelligence, enormous amount of wealth. Quinti, Kun, Queen Kunti, in her prayer to Krishna, Janmaishwarya Shruti Shribir Eda Mana Madapuma, she tells that 
these material qualifications potentially could be great disqualifications for spiritual life. Sudarshan had all of them. He had a very high birth, being the leader of the Vidyadhara Devas. He had extraordinary physical beauty, incredible knowledge and wealth. But it made him proud. There were some descendants of Angira Muni who were Brahmins and sages. <clears throat> he says, Once I saw some homely sages. Homely means ugly. Doesn't mean like people who make you feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> because in India, I don't know how much you understand English like that. <laughs> it's a homely sage. That means a sage that makes you feel at home. <laughs> in this sense, it means somebody whose physical features are already ugly. Oh. <laughs> but they were descendants of Angira Muni. <clears throat> and he says, proud of my beauty, I ridiculed them. You see, this is the nature of the ego. When we have something that's considered by material standards to be valuable, the tendency is, I think myself better than another. And as soon as we fall into that trap, as soon as we're swallowed by that snake, the, the snake of ahankar or ego, then we, we become inattentive. And in that inattention we feel that we have a right to criticize, to blaspheme, or to ridicule another person. If you're humble, you'll never do that. Because you don't feel you have a right to do that. Yes? But because he was thinking, I am so handsome, so beautiful, and these people are so ugly. It began in his mind, he was thinking, how he was superior to them because of his features being superior to theirs. But this same type of ego can come out in so many ways and so many forms. I sing better than her, or I have nicer clothes than her, or I have a better husband than her, or I have a nicer wife than him, or I know more verses than him or more people come to my lectures than his. <laughs> so many ways of getting swallowed by the snake of the false ego, yes? And the reality is, if we're humble, I'm gonna to try to get a little poetic here. If we're humble, then we will recognize when we have false pride, that we're being swallowed by the serpent of egoism. Yes? Instead of acting according to the dictations of the ego, if we realize we're being swallowed by this snake of egoism, which is death to our spiritual lives, like Nanda Maharaj will real, we'll realize our helpless condition and will cry out to Krishna to save us. Because ultimately, this 
false ego is more powerful than our mind, our intelligence, or any of our material abilities. The ahankar is an it's the most powerful energy in material creation that Maya uses to entrap us. And if we think that with my knowledge of the scriptures and my power to discriminate and my tapasya, my austerities and my ability, because this snake was eating Nanda Maharaj and he only drank water all day. <laughs> he was doing good austerities. And he was Krishna's father. So we may think I'm a Vaishnav, but how many of us are Krishna's father? <laughs> whatever our birth, whatever our position, whatever our knowledge, still, in relation to the false ego, the snake of the ahankar is eating all of us. We're in those jaws. And then we fall victim. To have, Queen Kunti concludes this verse, Twam Akinchana Gocharam. But Krishna is the property of those who are in poverty. But, you know, if we go to poverty stricken places, it's not that people are, not, are necessarily any more humble than people who have a lot. You know, if you go to some, you know, whether it's in the East or the West, you know, somebody may have a little brass pot and they're very proud. You don't have a brass pot. I have a brass pot. Or somebody may be strong or a better fighter or somebody may be getting better relationships with the opposite sex, so just see how great, superior I am to you. So even people in the most desperate conditions can still be proud of having something. That's the nature of the ego. What to speak of people who act, because whatever we have, whenever we think we're better than someone else, we should understand we're being swallowed by the snake. So Kunti says, you are the property of the, those who are impoverished. Janasya mohoya mahamma meti. This is what impoverished means from a spiritual perspective. Impoverished means we are no longer thinking in terms of I and mine. I am not this body. Whether I'm beautiful or ugly, I'm not this body. This is Krishna's body, whatever it looks like. It's a wonderful tool to serve. If I'm trying to be the enjoyer because it's me, then, it's, then the snake is swallowing us. But if we're in this mood of servant, and nothing is mine, whether I'm a homely, descendant of Angira Muni, that means an ugly descendant of Angira or whether I'm Sudarshan the Vidyadhara, who's so attractive and so beautiful. If Sudarshan came to Mumbai, <laughs> every Bollywood actor and actress would be falling at his feet asking for blessings. <laughs> Yes, he would be the ultimate. How he sings, how he dances, he would make them all look like little hopping frogs. <laughs> what he could do, when he wants to dance, he could dance in the sky. <laughs> and his body, his body, which is, you know, lives for countless ages, it could move any way he wishes. Demigods are like that. You know, we have to do all kinds of training and dancing to try to move in a certain way, and then as we get old, we can't do it. We have to try harder, and somebody else is dancing better. <laughs> but he can just, you know, he can put his, he could just 
start wiggling his toes on top of his head. He could do anything he wants in the sky and be making circles. And this is Vidyadhara. He's incredible. He's so beautiful. So whether we are a, an ugly sage or whether we're a most popular among the demigods, the principle is it, nothing is mine. My abilities, Krishna says, I'm the intelligence of the intelligent in the Gita. I'm the strength of the strong. And the abilities of everyone. So if we recognize this, we never become proud. We see somebody else, and this is Krishna. Is. We recognize and appreciate Krishna wherever we see his. So to be impoverished simply means to recognize that nothing is mine. Everything is the property of the higher power of Ishwara, the controller of all controllers. And I'm the servant. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains to actually access the power of the holy name in a very full way, Trinadapi Sunichena, Taror Ibasi Hishna. Amani na manadena kirtaniya sadahari. We should be humble like a blade of grass, tolerant, forgiving, generous, in a spirit of like a in a spirit of of kindness, like a tree, and to find joy in offering respect to others. and not to, to be obsessed with the need to be respected myself. In this spirit, we can actually cry out Krishna's names. Nanda Maharaj, he was a great king. But he was humble like a blade of grass. He was no ego. He was simply serving in every way. He was a kinshina gochara. So this Krishna being the poverty, the property of those who are in poverty means Krishna is the property of those who don't have that obsession to prove themselves to be better than others who actually respect others. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we become useless. Humility doesn't mean, well, everyone else is better than me, so let them trample on my head in every way. Because our Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna was Trinata Bisuni Chena. He was very humble and respectful, but he still fought the war. And he still fought the war to win. He wasn't fighting the war thinking, well, I'm humble, let me just shoot, but, you know, Krishna will arrange. With all of his power, with all of his intelligence, he was fighting to win, but without ego. He was doing it for Krishna, and ultimately he knew that I'm Ananyas Chintayantomam. We have to do the best we can but ultimately Krishna is giving us whatever we have. And ultimately we're depending on Krishna. So in this way Sudarshan is telling that I thought myself superior because they were ugly and I was beautiful. So I ridiculed them. And by their kindness, they cursed me to become the 
ugliest, most terrible snake crawling on the ground. Quite bitter medicine for a beautiful demigod and all the demigoddesses are just looking at him with their lotus eyes and saying, oh, you are so nice. And he's flying and he's doing whatever he wants and he's enjoying fine foods and he's living in palaces. And now he's a dirty snake just crawling on the ground. And nobody with lotus eyes is looking at him anymore saying, oh, you are so nice. He can't, snakes can't dance very well. He didn't have any house. He was just living in holes in the ground. Yes. Quite a, and it happened instantly. It's not that, you know, he continued his demigod birth for so many millions of years and then he took birth in the, in the womb of a little mother snake. Then <laughs> he came out <laughs> of the little egg and uh, no, suddenly it, it all a flash. He's Sudarshan, the Vidyadhara, and the next second he's got the snake body. He just like doesn't even have feet. <laughs> doesn't even can you imagine what a culture shock that must have been to him? <laughs> Really, think about it. If all of a sudden you were a snake, you would want to get up and go to Mongol art. <laughs> you don't, all of a sudden, I don't have any feet anymore. <laughs> and you want to eat something, and I don't have any hands anymore. And, you know, to eat, you have to just go and go, and somehow or other catch it with your mouth. That's a culture shock. And all of a sudden, everybody hates you. Yes? Because nobody likes snakes. No humans hardly like snakes. Some do. And animals, they don't like snakes either. And other snakes, I don't know if snakes like each other. (laughs) Usually snakes are kind of alone, aren't they? It's not like you see flocks of snakes, like you see flocks of birds, or herds of snakes, like you see herds of buffaloes. (laughs) It doesn't seem that snakes even like each other. (laughs) What do you think, Ananda (laughs) Vrindavan? So now he's cursed, and suddenly he's a snake. But he still has the intelligence of a demigod. That's even worse. (laughs) He has all his past memories. He still has the mind of the Vidyadhara. But he has a body of a snake. Quite an adjustment. But Krishna, he knows everything. He's in everyone's heart. It was by his will that Nanda Maharaj and all the gopas and Krishna came to that place to worship Shiva. And he started swallowing Nanda Maharaj to get the mercy of Krishna. And ultimately Krishna placed his foot on him. And he's now he realizes how he was swallowed by the snake of his own false ego. And it was only by, and this is an important thing, he was delivered not because he was swallowing Nanda Maharaj. He had this intelligence. He was delivered because Nanda Maharaj called out for Krishna. It wasn't that Sudarshan, while he was eating, was going, Krishna, Krishna, blah, blah, blah. Nanda Maharaj called for Krishna. So in the same way, 
when, Krish, when a great devotee of the Lord calls for Krishna, that's how we are saved. It's like Srila Prabhupada. He was on the Jaladuta. He was praying to Krishna to come and help all of us. And Krishna came. And we were all like little vidyadharas in our own way with our egos. Advaita Charya, he saw all the egoism in the world and he cried out. He cried out like Nanda Maharaj. He cried out for, for Krishna to come to the earth to save them. To save us. So this is the power of when a great devotee calls out. So Sudarshan is saying that he considered the curse of the sages to be a great blessing because it cured him of his false ego. And now by Krishna's grace he resumed his original form but now he's an enlightened pure devotee of the Lord. He has received Krishna's grace. Now he's Sudarshan, the Vidyadhara, with ecstatic love for Krishna, rather than snake-like ego. <coughs> and after he narrates this wonderful story of his life, how he came to Krishna consciousness, or his journey home. <laughs> it's a good story. It's on the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam forever. <laughs> then Krishna blesses him and he goes back to his heavenly abode. And then the next story that's being told, we will discuss tomorrow. There. Well, actually, I'm not here tomorrow, but we'll discuss it sometime. <laughs> Is there any questions? Yes. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. <clears throat> you are mentioning about... Um, but the next, <clears throat> the next the story is very similar. Just to say something very briefly. This today's story, or in the past verses, is on Shivaratri. And the next story is on Holi or Gaur Purnima. <clears throat> and the gopis are playing with Krishna and Balaram and Shankachuda, who's also a demigod, a friend of Kuvera, who had tremendous wealth and tremendous beauty and tremendous powers. He also was so egoistic that he wanted to, he was trying to steal the gopis from Krishna. Just see, Sudarshan, he was trying to swallow Nanda Maharaj for his own satisfaction. And Shankachuda was trying to steal the gopis away from Krishna for his satisfaction. And Krishna and Balaram also picked up logs to get him, and he ran away. But it's the same principle. He had a beautiful jewel on his head, and it made him so effulgent and enlightened and beautiful looking. He thought he had the right. He had the right to do anything he wanted. And who is this Krishna Balaram, these little children? Who are they to be enjoying these beautiful women? They are for me. So the same principle. His opulence, his wealth, his beauty, his strength made him proud. Yes. Maharaj, you are mentioning about how Srila Prabhupada, Advaita Acharya, they, the pure devotees pray for our deliverance. Like Nanda Maharaj called out to Krishna. That was the 
that was responsible for vidyadara sudarshan to be delivered as well when preaching we we try to remember this that we are not uh, you know we are not actually doing anything we are just instruments at the same time we feel responsible for people whom we are preaching to and uh, sometimes what happens many people come and uh, they expect us to give love affection talk to them nicely and we also we don't want them to be going away from krishna consciousness we are nice to them at the same time we you know preachers have an agenda we want them to chant we want them to take up to krishna consciousness and people also you know they expect us to have nice relations love affection and all that and then over a period of time there is a conflict of expectation the relationship with some people gets strained because preachers tend to spend more time with those who are showing more interest commitment service so some people so therefore what happens some people although they have, sh- they have shown promise in the beginning they may give up krishna consciousness because of not getting so much time or whatever so some strain so at that time how do we know that we are we are, are we responsible for their giving up krishna consciousness or you know like because you said in the beginning of the class that the devotee's fear should be that we should not displease krishna so how do we know you know we are displeasing krishna guru because it's not possible that we can please everyone and then sometimes some devotees give up krishna consciousness they may be initiated or they may have chanted 16 rounds at one point of time so as preaching is growing how do we know that we are not responsible or are we responsible for people giving up krishna consciousness hare krishna Krishna tells Arjuna that ultimately he's not the cause of the result of his services. But because we're doing it for Krishna and because what pleases Krishna most in this world is when we inspire others to know him and love him. we honestly and sincerely try our best but the results will not always be even the greatest acharyas people still have their free will and fall away shila bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur there is story of someone who was practicing bhakti and left the path and he was actually in tears saying i could not save him and she la prabhu par our own guru maharaj among several examples there's one of someone who actually went astray and after some months the person came back asking forgiveness but as soon as he came back Prabhupada embraced him and was crying he said since you left i've been praying for you and now you have come back so we should feel a personal um concern for people's lives <clears throat> and by taking such a responsibility that's how we make progress response taking responsibility is in krishna consciousness a very necessary form of bhakti because when we take responsibility and for a spiritual purpose that sense of responsibility is is a deep devotion yes if we don't take responsibility we're not really putting our heart into something and whatever we do we want to put our heart into it so it's important that we take responsibility <clears throat> whatever we're doing if we just whimsically sweep the floor whenever we feel like it there's not much of a depth of meditation there but when we actually take a responsibility to keep that floor clean then we're really putting our heart into it 
Yes. If a mother doesn't feel responsibility for their child, she's going to whimsically do what, what pleases her for the child. But if she feels, this, is my, this child is my responsibility, then she'll put her heart and soul and meditate on what's best for that child. So whatever we do, it's very conducive to our spiritual life to do it with a sense of responsibility. But at the same time, everyone has their free will. And we can only do what we can do. We all have our limitations. Part of humility is to understand and recognize my limitations. I can't be everything for everyone. Krishna can be everything for everyone. Krishna could dance with millions of gopis at the same time and remain a brahmachari. Can you do that? <laughs> I can't do it either. Nobody could do it except Krishna. Not even Vishnu can do it. <laughs> Lakshmi wanted to join the Ras Leela because she wanted to be with Krishna. She left Vaikuntha. And Vishnu and Krishna are one, but still, Krishna manifests such an opulence of love. So Krishna could please everyone. In Vrindavan, every flower, every twig, every insect, every gopa, every gopi, every cow, every deer, every tiger, Everyone Krishna is simultaneously reciprocating with in full. If Krishna could sit on the bank of the Yamuna with thousands of cowherd boys taking lunch, and every cowherd boy is thinking, Krishna's only looking at me. He doesn't stop looking at me and he's smiling at me. He loves me so much. There's so many other cowherd boys, but he just keeps looking at me. Can we do that? That's Krishna. So when we understand Krishna's powers, we don't try to be Krishna. The more we know Krishna's power, the more humble we become. The more we understand and realize our own limitations. But patram pushpam palam toyam. We may only have the capacity to offer a little flower. But if we do it with sincere sense of responsibility of devotion to please Krishna, then Krishna is pleased. <clears throat> we were Vrindavan Das Thakur and Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat gives an example. To just look at the sky. Where does the sky end? Yes, you just look up and it just keeps going and going and going. As far as our observation, there's no end to the sky in any direction. Yes, this whole earth planet is just like a little speck floating in the sky. Yes, the sky is infinite by our calculation. And a little bird with two little wings is flying. Yes? The little bird wants to fly across the sky. But how much of the sky can the bird cover? Just two days ago I was visiting one of my friends and we were looking out a window over the Arabian Sea. And as we were talking I was watching the birds. There were little birds, pigeons, kind of like sparrows, and they're flapping, really flip. The littler the bird, usually the harder they have to flap. Yes, did you ever see a hummingbird? They're going, their wings, you can't even see them, they're flapping so hard. It's just a blur. They're flapping like, you know, dozens and dozens of times a second just to stay in the air. Yes? And the sparrow, they're going, 
And the pigeon's going, doo, 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 and then higher is the hawk. He's going, <laughs> the hawk wasn't even flapping. He was just had his wings stretched, and he was just floating in the sky. And he was higher, way, way higher than all the other birds. Yes? And the hawk is looking down just relaxing, floating. If a high wind comes, he doesn't all of a sudden start going, Geez! he just moves one wing a little higher, <laughs> another wing. We were discussing this last night, that subject matter was striking balance in our lives. So the hawk is really striking a balance. Just by moving his wings a little this way, through his balancing, he can endure any type of situation. Whatever wind, whatever storm, it just balances. And the little birds, they're also balancing like... Tch, 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 tch. But they're really working hard. But he's on a higher platform. The little birds are like sadhana bhaktas, you know. <laughs> Vaidhi bhakti, they're really working hard. They're working, they're just trying to get up a little higher, a little higher. But when you actually get up high, it's really easy, it's spontaneous, you just float. It's like the Raganuga platform. Raganuga bird is the hawk, he's just effortlessly floating because he's, and he's so high up. The little birds can't get up to where the, to the hawk is. He's looking down at them. Why did I tell that story? <laughs> oh, the sky. That's right. Thank you. So, if you take the little sparrow, or the little hummingbird, he can't get up there where the hawk is. He's trying his best. He can't get that high, and the hawk is just, just floating. So from, this, from the little tiny bird's perspective, that hawk is really high up. But from our perspective, when we're you know, up in this high hotel room where I was visiting someone, looking out at the window, looking at the whole sky. What has the hawk done? Right? How far has he gotten into the sky? Insignificant. So this is the false ego. We think we're doing something great, but compared to Krishna, <laughs> compared to the people of the spiritual world, we are insignificant. Srila Prabhupada said this once. Srila Prabhupada said, or one devotee came and said, Prabhupada, I want to surrender everything. And Prabhupada said, what? He said, you know, Prabhupada was pleased with him, but he wanted to teach him a truth. He said, if everything belongs to Krishna, what do you have to surrender? <laughs> he said, the only thing you have to surrender is the illusion that you have something to surrender. Bali Maharaj, ultimately, the only thing he had to surrender was his free will. And Prabhupada said, we should understand that in relationship to Krishna and the ultimate truth, we are all insignificant. Yes? That hawk may think, when, he com when the hawk compares himself to the sparrows, he thinks, see how great I am. But when the hawk looks up at the 747 Air India jets, that are flying by, or jet airways. Kingfisher was humbled. <laughs> <laughs> of 
But <laughs> with all with all respect, with all respect. <laughs> but when, but when the when the hawk looks up at the airplanes, he realizes I'm insignificant. And when an airplane looks up at a rocket ship, that's insignificant. And compared to the entirety of the sky, the rocket ship is absolutely insignificant. Yes? You know, fly to the sun. The sun's right there. We see it. Why can't we get there? The sky is infinite. But Vrindavan Das Thakur said, according to our capacity, the gl- to the glories of the Supreme Lord, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Krishna, are m- infinite. And we're like little birds. The best we could do is try our best to fly across the sky. And Krishna is so pleased. If we just try our best with the right intention, Krishna is very happy. But we should do it with that humility. I may speak about Krishna, but what can I say? It's infinite. Just to give an a, a, a indication of the infiniteness. Vrindavan Das Thakur explains that even if we have a thousand mouths and we speak Krishna's leelas, for the entire time of the creation. We cannot fully explain what Krishna does in one moment. Hare Krishna. We only have one mouth. (laughs) And we we only live a few years. So what can we do? But still... If we just take responsibility to try our best with the right consciousness, then that's perfection. So we should try our best to accommodate, you know, every person that's coming before us. But at the same time, we can, we can only do what we can do. We shouldn't get depressed. We shouldn't get discouraged. We should just honestly and earnestly try our best and balance our life. Like that hawk balances himself when the winds and the storms come. We balance our life because if we need personal time for our sadhana, we need some personal time for our health, we need proper rest, we need proper nutrition, we need proper satsang, to, you know, to be with others, to actually receive their blessings. If we don't receive blessings, we have nothing to give of much value. So we can't become, you know, passionately, oh, this person and that person and everybody else. We have to try our best in a balanced, responsible way. Responsibility means to take responsibility for the body that Krishna has given us, taking responsibility for the families or the or the God brothers and God sisters that we're living with, taking responsibility if we have a career or service, you may be doing some puja, you may be doing some cleaning, these are also our responsibilities for our sadhana, to do it carefully with attention. And then, as far as our outreach of trying to reach people, we try our best with respect. And Krishna is pleased. And in some circumstances, it will appear that your endeavors are a failure. And in some cases, it will appear that your endeavors are a success. But in Krishna's eyes, it's all a success. If we have the proper attitude and we're trying our best. Does that answer your question? Thank you. I think we should end because it's becoming late. Thank you very much.